20. Firing chain is armed. Sound suppression water system activated. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5.
is, in your life, are you like me, or are you like my friend? So, what I mean by that is, do you get caught for things you do wrong, or do you manage to do things like secretive and behind people's backs, and like maybe you do the one thing here, but you do something else when you're outside of the senior high, or when you're when your parents run around when no one's looking? Um, do you manage to get away with that kind of stuff? Where, which one of those two do you lie? Now, no, typically, it'll people say that the older <coughs> sibling gets caught with everything, and the younger ones get away with everything. But it really doesn't matter where you lie in the family. Um, it's really where are you in life? Are you the one that gets caught with everything, or are you the one who tries to sneak around and you think you don't get caught? Or so far, you've been doing all these things and you haven't gotten caught. I want to throw out, do you have a secret sin in your life that you're hiding from your friends, your family, your small group? Maybe like you're one way here, you're one way on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, and you're completely different when your Christian friends aren't looking, when your Christian family isn't looking. If that's you, you are not getting away with anything. You are not getting away with secret sin outside of these four walls. Every sin that you commit outside is being kept track of by a God that sees all, by a God that knows all, by the God who judges thoughts, attitudes, words, and motives. If you're a Sunday Christian, if you're a Wednesday night Christian, you are not getting away with anything. There's no secret sin. It might be hidden from the people in your life, but the creator of everything, the one who knows your thoughts, knows exactly what's going on in your life, and judgment must be paid for it. Bad news bears. I want you to imagine that you are on trial <coughs> for stealing money slowly over time. So like, over a period of 40 years, you're stealing money. You steal a dollar, five bucks at a time. You know, not really a big deal. And you've lived your whole life thinking that that little bit of money you're stealing every single time is not getting caught by anybody, is not being seen, that no one's able to track that. Um, you're getting away with it. And you go 40 years stealing money little by little, dollar here, dollar there, and let's just say you're really good at it, and suddenly you've stolen seven and a half billion dollars. Suddenly, someone says something, they catch you once, and they say, hey, I think that guy's stealing money. So you're brought to court, you're put on trial, and here's the bad news. I know this is not a real life scenario, but just go there with me. Let's say you get caught stealing seven and a half billion dollars. If they find you guilty, you're gonna be put to death. You sit there thinking, that, hey, I've covered my tracks this whole time, I've been able to or, like, keep a secret from people, I've been able to hide this part of my life from the rest of the world, and I think I'm okay. I'm going to cover my tracks, my tracks have been covered well, and I'm not going to be condemned for this. I'm not going to be found guilty. And you're, you're, but you're kind of a little nervous, because like, if you do get found guilty, that's it, it's the death penalty. And so you're thinking you're good, like, I, okay. And all of a sudden, as the case is brought forth, there is evidence from every single time that you stole even a cent. What's your feeling? There's evidence to prove every single time that you stole a penny for seven and a half billion dollars. Again, bad news bears. There's no defense for that. The evidence is out there. There's no hiding from it. It's all out in the open for everybody to see. And Every time you stole, thought about stealing, talked about stealing, is something on the record for the judge to see. For some of you, that's your life. For some of you, you, you think you're hiding things from the rest of the world, from, your, from yourself. You're, you, you're kind of like just pushing it aside, getting out of your head. You think you're hiding from your parents. It's, the evidence is all going to come to light one day, whether it's in this life or the next. But it's going to come out. And... 
Like I said, right now there's sin in your life. You think you're getting away with it, but you're not. You're not. You're living under the reign of a God who sees all and knows all. And he's completely fair and just because, yeah, God is so loving and so holy and so merciful and so patient. But we can't elevate those attributes of God over the attributes of just and fairness. And so God is, God's going to serve the punishment. There's going to be someone that has to pay for that sin that's in your life. Okay, so now let's, let's change this a little bit. You're at the same courtroom. You're sitting there, evidence stacked against you. The judge is about to give you a verdict that, that you know as soon as he says it, you're condemned to the death sentence. And all of a sudden, he says, in light of the evidence brought forth to me against the defendant, I find him not guilty. And here's a new car. It's like the price is right. Stoked. What would your reaction be? You're thinking like, all this evidence is against me, I think I'm gonna just be put to death right here, and all of a sudden the judge says, not guilty, new car, have a nice day, great knowing you. You're stoked. That's awesome. That is so exciting. What would the people in the courtroom think? What would you think? What would every what would the reactions be? People would go nuts. That would be all over the news. Um, you stole seven and a half billion. They have the evidence to prove that you did it. Yet you're set free with a car. Is that fair? You're like, yeah, sweet, I'm free. But is that fair? So you did it. They caught you doing it, but they're gonna let you go and give you a car. It's not fair at all. But what if you dug deeper behind that and found out that someone has paid the seven and a half billion dollars for you? Said, you know what? I know he stole the money. I'm going to front that money. He bought you the car with the little money he had left over. First of all, you have one rich friend. I'm just saying. And then he took the death penalty for you. He just said, you know what? I'm just going to take it all, and then that's it. And that's things change because justice has been served. The money's paid back. You get a sweet new ride. And the death penalty has been brought, taken out on someone. The punishment was there. <coughs> Things change. And that person, what we, we like to call, was showing you mercy and grace. And I don't think we can understand mercy and grace until we understand how bad sin is, sin is in our life. It's like that broken mirror we had over here last week. We can't understand how awesome and amazing mercy and grace and are until we understand how bad sin is and how much secret sin really destroys our lives. And so it's like telling, let's say you're sitting in the doctor's office and all of a sudden they say, hey, uh, you're really healthy and good news is uh, your cancer was healed. Okay, sweet, I didn't know I had cancer. Like, um, it's knowing that your cancer is healed is not as sweet and is not as um, wonderful and not as amazing if you didn't know that you had cancer in the first place. If you had stage five, whatever the most terminal cancer is, and all of a sudden the doctor said, hey, good news, you're healthy and the cancer's gone. That would be amazing because you understood how bad things were. If you don't know you have cancer, if you don't know how bad sin is, the grace of, and mercy of Jesus <coughs> Christ is not as sweet as it could be in your life. So you guys need to understand how bad sin really is and how destructive it really is. And that's why I'm so harsh about it and so, and so tough about it. It's because it destroys lives. And I don't want that for you. I want so much better for each and every one of you. I want you all to really understand what mercy and grace look like and how awesome it is that Jesus paid our punishment so we could have this mercy and grace. So I don't yell at you guys for scare tactics. I don't yell at you guys to, to make a statement. I yell at you guys so you understand how bad sin really is. I can yell that same statement to myself. I fall into sin all the time. I'm not above sin. I'm a sinner just like you. But the difference is, are we going to repent of that and receive mercy and grace, or are we just going to let that, sit there and let that destruction, like that broken mirror last week, just completely wreck our lives? So, especially if there's sin that you're not telling people about, you're not getting out in the light, that needs to be out in the light so you can have that mercy and grace and that reconciliation that's only offered through Jesus Christ who took the punishment for us so that Judge God can say, hey, 
your debt's paid, here's a new car, see you later. Jesus took the punishment for you. God said, this man is guilty of all this sin and needs to be punished. And Jesus said, hey, you know what, God? Punish me instead. I'll take it for them. I'll show them mercy by not allowing them to get what they really deserve, which is hell. Withheld punishment of hell. And I'll give them grace, which is getting what we don't deserve. And that's all the blessings. The ability to have friends and relationships and even breathe. That's all evidences of God's grace in our life. Unmerited favor. That's what grace is. Like a new car. You didn't deserve a new car. You didn't do anything that... You didn't do anything. You should have been pronounced guilty, but now you have a new car. That's what grace looks like. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 says this. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only then, by God's grace, that you have been saved. Like I said, you got to understand how bad sin is before you understand how good grace is. And since Jesus was punished once and for all, we don't have to be. He's taken our punishment away so that we can have something that we don't deserve. And that's life. That's friendship. That's breathing. That's being able to wake up every day and just to live the life that Jesus has called us to. That's, the, that's being able to reflect Him to the world. That's all evidence of God's grace. And <coughs> Jesus looks at us and says, Hey, I was punished. So there is no sin in those people. They are no longer slaves to sin. I was punished for it. God, put the punishment on me. I'll take the wrath. I will go to the cross. I will be put to death for these people so that there will be no sin, so that they'll be clean. They will be washed. They will be pure. They will be righteous. They will be made holy. You can look at them, God, the same way you look at me. Perfect. And I need you to know this. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are looked on as perfect in God's sight. Now, that's not very good news if you already thought you were perfect, a really good person. Understanding how bad sin is in your life makes the fact that you're looked at as perfect that much better. I said there's no sin in that man. Do you understand how awesome and how sweet that is? To Even when you sin and you fall down and you, you're, you get caught up along the way, God still says, hey, there's no sin in that man or that woman. I see them as made holy. Guys, if there's repentance of sin, there is mercy and grace and forgiveness, and God does not see the sin in us. And that is awesome. And so, here's the thing. It's not about what we do. It's, not, it's about what Jesus Christ has done. He's shown us the grace and mercy on the cross. And because He's shown us that, this is where we take that and we reflect it to the world around us. Even though we're broken mirrors, we will one day be made perfect in glorified bodies in heaven. But until then, we can still reflect Jesus to the world. And... We can, show him we can show the world mercy, which is what we did on City Dive this past Saturday. We went to the city, we prayed with people, we hung out with them, we just talked to them, we handed out homeless caregiver kits, just to show mercy, because Jesus has already shown us mercy. And we're like, yeah, that's, that's sweet that we get mercy. We want other people to know what that's like. Some of these people on the streets, and maybe they're, they don't even have to be on the streets, they could be in your very own household, in your school, on your sports team, they don't know what being shown mercy and grace is like because they think that it's all about what they do to earn something. Reality is, we don't have to do anything because we can't earn anything because all we deserve is a punishment. But since Jesus took it, we get to enjoy the reward. And so, showing that mercy is crucial to them because some people don't see it. And so, I want to ask... Where have you been hard-hearted and not shown grace to someone? Where is there someone in your life that needs to have uh, mercy shown to them and grace shown to them, the reflection of Jesus Christ in their life? Who is that person? I want you all to have a, an image in your mind of a person. I know there's one for everybody. I got one right now in my mind. This week, are you going to be hard-hearted and continue to ignore them or push them away or be cold towards them? or to talk about them or gossip about them behind their back. Are you going to turn around and say, you know what? I've been shown this amazing mercy. Now, I just want to show it 
I've been shown this amazing grace and this amazing mercy. I just want to show it to someone else because it's so freaking cool. It's so awesome. And so, like it says in Romans, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. So why should we condemn other people? Why should we not show them mercy? What's the reason for not doing that? If it's not about what, if it's not about what they've done and it's just like a free gift of grace, why should we not show someone grace, Even no, matter, no matter what they do? Everything changes when you look at it from the cross. So this week what I want us to do is realize, hey, that's, that sin in my life or in, in other people's lives is bad news bears. It is killing them. It is destroying me and them from the inside out, even if I don't even realize it and if I think I'm getting away with it. It's not going anywhere. God sees it. Yet, knowing how bad that sin is, we can, in turn, look to the cross and say, yeah, this sin is so bad and so horrible, but that just makes grace and mercy that much sweeter and that much more amazing in our lives. And we're so excited about that that I want to take that mercy that God shows and reflect it back out to the rest of the world and show them the grace and mercy that God shows us. And so, in our, as we choose to go vertical and pursue God, let's reflect mercy back down just the way He has shown it to us. Because... I tell you, when we do that to people and they're not expecting it, you catch them completely off guard. You ever, someone's like yelling at you or like attacking you, and all of a sudden you say a kind word, what does that do? They're like, they don't know what to do. Because when you show them grace and mercy, things change. When you bring the love of Christ into it, things change. I'm telling you, the love of Christ is the power to change lives from the inside out. And we get the opportunity to do that. So awesome. So awesome. So I hope you guys are excited about it. I hope you guys are excited to be the ones that are driving this um, this go vertical engine along SPC. Because it's cool to see the way that some of the staff and of, of other ministries get excited about it and wanting to work with us to be able to do this. So um, in your small groups tonight, I want you to just talk about that person or that situation or that scenario where it's like I'm being hard hearted and I got to show grace to that person. I got to show mercy to them. And then when you, if you have enough time and you talk about all that, talk about a time when someone showed you grace and mercy and what that looked like in your life. Capish? Capish. Cool beans. Oh. I'm going to pray. Let's get out of here. Father, when we look at our sin and how destructive it is and how much it really wrecks us from the inside out, we have nothing but bad news. But Father, through the grace and mercy that you show us on the cross, man, there is nothing sweeter and nothing more amazing. And so understanding our sin leads us to understanding how good your grace in our life is. So, Father, I pray that people here would realize that there is no sin in them. They are no longer slaves to the pattern of this world. They are free. They are clean. They are forgiven. They are bought with your blood if they belong to you. And I pray that that message would sink in for all of us, but especially people who have not yet chosen that for their lives. I pray that they see this offer, this invitation of being able to run to the cross with their deepest and darkest and most disgusting sin and for you to say, hey, I don't care what, you do, what you've done, I'm going to look at you as forgiven and clean because you're repentant and because you want to make this go away in your life. So, God, help us to reflect mercy back out to the world. Help us to uh, make a change in this church, in this community, in this town in this city, in this area, in the Northwest, God, help us to make a change in this world, enabled by the grace and mercy of your Son. And thank you that it is just so sweet and so good and so awesome. And I pray that people here would get hyped about it and be excited. I pray for our time in small groups that you would fill the rooms. And I pray for the worship band as they take us out with this last song. Father, pray all these things in your Son's good name. Amen. Amen.